ladies and gentlemen, you need to know that um, I take no special delight in exposing the teaching of my friend, Clyde Pilkington, and my friend Stephen Hill. Uh, I don't, well, I was going to say I don't live for this, but apparently I do. Uh, it needs done. It's this important, or I wouldn't keep harping on it. We're talking about our conduct in this life. We're talking about the focus of our affections in this life. We're talking about behavior in an unprecedented, literally, an unprecedented era. It's unprecedented among the unprecedented. It was unprecedented when Paul started it. And of course, every minute that goes by since Paul's day is unprecedented because it's a minute closer to the snatching away of the body of Christ, which is the next big thing on God's timetable. And today we find ourselves in perilous periods, the perilous periods that were predicted by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Therefore, it is important to know how we are to behave ourselves. Something really hit me when I turned off the microphone and the camera after last, after yesterday's show. I looked, I read again Clyde Pilkington's statement in volume 488, is it, of uh, the Bible Students Notebook, and it hit me. It's so obvious now how wrong this is, and it's glaring. And it's a little embarrassing, which is why I take no delight in exposing it. But it has to be done, else you will be misled into thinking that the highest form of spirituality today is to be a husband or a wife or a father or a mother, and that if you live in accord with Paul's exhortations in 1 Corinthians 7 to hold loosely to the world, that you are of necessity disappointing God, disgracing God the message of his grace, bringing sorrow to every heart. This is the furthest thing from the truth. I'm quoting now from Clyde Pilkington's article, and it hit me big time. This is a new thing I'm giving you. And again, I take no special thrill in this at all. Quote, we have dealt previously in the Bible Students Notebook with the dispensational context of 1 Corinthians. An approach to life based on this passage from a previous economy would be a dishonor to God and contrary to his present purpose as revealed through Paul's further advanced revelations found in his latter epistles. As a result, it will also wreak unnecessary havoc in one's personal and domestic life, bringing added sorrow to the heart and disgrace to the message of his grace. A husband who erroneously attempts to conduct his life today as though he had no wife most likely will find himself actually not having one. Unquote. And in case you haven't seen it, and the full force of it didn't dawn on me until after I turned the microphone off yesterday, here it is. As if Paul would, in any era, give believers in the body of Christ, a, or a, in anybody, for that matter, a recommendation that if followed would cause one to lose one's wife. This exposes the whole teaching as fantasy, as false. This thing is based upon the assumption that when Paul says 
uses the phrase the present necessity in 1 Corinthians 7.26. Let's read the context. I'm inferring then this ideal to be inherent, that is to Let's do the whole context in 25, 1 Corinthians 7.25. Now concerning the celibates or virgins, I have no injunction of the Lord, yet an opinion am I giving as one who has enjoyed mercy by the Lord to be faithful. I am inferring then this ideal to be inherent because of the present necessity, for it is ideal for humanity to be thus. The present necessity is said to be a especially percusatory time under the administration of Nero where it was no good like for a period of months or whatever to it was no good to be married it was no good to keep your virgin celibate or no it was good to keep your virgin celibate it was good to keep everybody celibate don't do anything don't don't Fall in love with anybody, don't marry anybody because we got this persecution going on. The word necessity here in the Greek simply means compression, the present compression. I say to you that we're still in the present compression. We're still being compressed. The compression began with the announcement of an evangel that trumped the gospel of the circumcision and brought on the persecution of the circumcision. And many of the believers of this day would not have had problems with Nero had they followed Paul's advice in Romans 13, be subject to the superior authorities. But as I said to you yesterday, and I, as I've been saying to you, Paul's day when compared with this day, will look like Girl Scout camp. Because Paul, as bad as things were in his time, says that, no, this, in the latter days, perilous periods will be present. But I thought Paul lived in the most perilous period of all. That's when the compression started. But Paul said it will get worse. We're now living in that era. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Know this, that in the last days, perilous periods will be present. Perilous periods. We're in the last days. He calls that a time of compression. He calls this a time of peril. Peril. The compression is more compressed. It's like a car tire being inflated beyond 35 pounds, beyond 55 pounds, beyond 65 pounds. Up. Pumping it up, pumping it up. How much can it take before it blows? That's where we are. Paul didn't know compression like the pressure we feel today. He didn't. Well, maybe him as the one man. He was under ultra scrutiny, under ultra, per, ultra persecution. When people take out packs on your life, then yes. But as a whole, as a body, we are under more compression as a body. Back to this nonsense of saying that, quote, a husband who erroneously attempts to conduct his life today as though he had no wife, quoting again from Paul, let those having wives be as not having them. I contend to you that this is current practical advice of loosening one's grip on one's loved ones in comparison to one's looking for Jesus Christ. As if Paul would give advice during any era which, quote, would likely find a man actually not having a wife. So Paul's giving advice here that would wreak unnecessary havoc in one's personal and, and domestic life. Seriously, let's take a look at this. Let's say that Paul's era was, an, even for the time, an unprecedented era of persecution. Why would Paul even in an era of persecution, suddenly change his teaching and tell people, okay, now I want you to do things that will result in unnecessary havoc in your personal and 
and domestic life. Yeah, that, that would be the perfect thing to do during an era that already is wreaking havoc. We have an era that is politically wreaking havoc on you. So now my new recommendation to you, which is a, I'm giving you strange advice now, I'm telling you something I've never told you before, let those having wives be as though not having them. According to Clyde, this, if anybody follows this advice in this era, he's going to wreak unnecessary havoc in his life, bring sorrow to the heart, and disgrace the message of grace. Those are quotes. And a husband who erroneously attempts to follow this today will actually find himself not having a wife. But if this is true today, why wouldn't it also be true then? And why would Paul give advice that would wreak more havoc in an era that's already havoc-filled? As if that would be good advice at any time, at any time whether you're living in an era of persecution or an era of peace. It makes no sense that Paul would give advice. I keep repeating this to make sure you get it. That Paul would give advice like this that in any era would bring havoc. And once again, we must follow through and look at the greater context of rejoicing and lamenting and buying is not using up. Buying is not retaining, using the, the world is not using it up. And we would have to say that these things too, that anyone, I'll quote again, an approach to life based on this passage, passage mind you, but Clyde never looks at the passage. He only looks at the one cherry picked section of husbands not having of husbands treating their wives as though not having them. And that works both ways. Wives treat your husbands. Paul just doesn't say it. It's, an, it's a, what you would call what, an ellipsis. An approach to life based on this passage, passage from a previous economy would be a dishonor to God and contrary to his present purpose. So it would be a dishonor to God to buy things but not retain them. That would be a dishonor to God today. It's a dishonor to God to do that, a dishonor to not lament as the rest of the world, to not rejoice as the rest of the world. To be rejoicing, though, is not rejoicing because the present era is passing by. That, that, that would be a dishonor to God. It will wreak, if, if you do this, if you buy things and hold them loosely, it will, quote, wreak unnecessary havoc in your personal and domestic life. No, it's just the opposite of what Clyde's insisting here. It will wreak unnecessary havoc in your personal and domestic life if you buy stuff and retain it. If you use the world and use it up. If you suck the life out of this world, like with a giant straw, <laughs> taking the last slurps of chocolate milk from the bottom of the glass, that's what Paul means when he says in 1 Corinthians 7, using the world, but don't use it up. In other words, don't get your straw in there and suck up the very last drops of the chocolate milk. <laughs> That's using it up. Use it, but don't use it up. Don't suck the life out of it. Don't wring the sponge in your mouth until you get every last drop of whatever elixir or intoxicant this world offers. That's good advice for today. Yet, Clyde says that because it belongs to this passage, it will dishonor God if you don't use up the world, if you don't suck every drop from this place of doom, death, and destruction. So the huge mistake is laid bare here to think that Paul would give advice that in any era would cause one to lose one's wife. Here, 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 here's a great idea. Since you're living in an era of great persecution, I want you to live, I want you to have wives as not ha having them, and chances are good now if you treat your wife this way during this era of persecution, then you actually won't have one. It, it, it's possible that the advice, the advice I'm giving you will actually cause you to not have a wife, and that's the right prescription for an era of persecution. We're going to remedy the persecution of Nero by giving you advice concerning your marriage that will likely drive your wife from you. Great, great. No, it's stupid. It's simply not the case. 
and I'm adamant about it. Now, listen to Stephen Hill, who makes the same mistake in volume, I think he's writing in volume 490. All right, Clyde assumes that with a supposed epic change in eras, singleness is no longer the ideal, and domestic life now has a paramount place in spirituality. This is from a quote from Clyde's article again first. Ephesians represents the pinnacle of Paul's revelation. That's true. Here he lays forth the secret economy in which we know. Well, it could be true. I kind of think Romans is, but in this epistle, um, he lays forth here the secret economy in which we now live today. In this epistle, rather than prompting singleness and a weaning of domestic life as he had done previously, he... he no, he doesn't. He does pro promote and prompt singleness, but not a weaning of domestic life. I'm not going to be able to get any farther than here. I'm going to pick up with this tomorrow. I'm on fire for this. This is such bad advice, and it's such misleading advice to say that Paul is is recommending a weaning of domestic life, as if we're to pull away from our wives or our children. He's not telling us to pull away. He's saying having wives, having wives be as though not have the, the import of the phrase as though is completely missed by these writers, Clyde Pilkington and Stephen Hill. It, it and it's just so casually inserted here that Paul is recommending a weaning of domestic life. Like, just, just get yourself away from it. No, he's saying remain in it. And again, I say he's not telling you, Paul, is not telling you to stop buying things, to stop using the world, to stop rejoicing, to stop it's as if Paul's saying, wean yourself from rejoicing, wean yourself from mourning. No, we just don't mourn as the world mourns. That's it. It's that simple. And yet, this passage is misused and abused, and it becomes a text weapon against a singleness and a pureness for Christ. Now, being married does, to a degree, take your affections away from Christ because a husband must please his wife and a wife must please her husband. Yes. And Paul said, yeah, it's ideal not to be in that circumstance. But here's a way, this is a gracious way of Paul, because there some people could say, oh my God, Paul, you gave a great recommendation that those who have wives should, uh, no, that uh, a man should not even get married in the first place. That's great advice. Wish I had taken it, Paul, but I didn't. Now I find myself with a wife. I find myself with a, a husband. And Paul would say, yeah, it, it, it's true, but you know what? You don't sin by doing that. You are in it now, and now you cannot be undistracted for the Lord, because you must think about what your wife needs. You must think about what your husband needs. You, so you can't be undistracted from the Lord. But, Paul says, I'll give you another way to do it. I'll give you another way that you can remain in the place you are. You can remain in the station in which you are called married with children. You can remain there, and at the same time, you can enjoy a modified singleness and pureness for Christ. Paul. Paul, how could I possibly do that? Like this. Let those having wives, having them, be as though not having them. See, it's like you, you have your wife, but you and your spouse, for instance, call a time out for a time of prayer. It's the same type of thing. Paul says, you know, give yourself leisure for prayer. Like, cut yourself some slack here to have prayer. It's the same type of advice. Would Clyde say when Paul recommends that you, um, Paul says, you know, give yourself to one another, give your body to your husband, give your body to your wife, don't withhold sex from one another, enjoy yourselves, be enmeshed, blah, blah, but don't be overindulged in the, so the fact that you have no leisure to talk to God. 
together. So Paul says, you know, there, there are times when you become a little bit separated, a little bit separated, a little bit separated, so that you have leisure to think about God, think about Christ. It's the same advice. Would Clyde say to this, that this is, a, this is bad? No. Paul would never, he's giving that advice to be, just, and Paul says later, come together later, lest you be tempted, you know. So don't, make sure you come together after you've had this leisure so if Paul's giving the recommendation to come together, he must be giving the recommendation to in some way come apart. Why isn't Clyde saying that this only belongs to a early era? Paul would never tell anybody to come apart because if, if a man and a wife just disengage for a short period of time, then uh, it's the same thing as having the possibility of losing your spouse. I mean, no, nobody says this. And yet this advice applies to the entire marriage, not just the entanglement of body parts, right? Paul's talking about specifically body parts when he says, you know, don't be so overindulged that you have no leisure for prayer. Now he's talking about the marriage in general. In general, he's saying. He's saying just having a wife, period, not being, having these intersecting body parts all the time. He's saying just having a wife. And in that context, you're to be as though not having one. And again, it goes both ways. It's not getting rid of, it's uh, it's in the big picture appreciating the things of God, not becoming too involved. And I got a great quote from A.E. Nock here, which I'm going to give you tomorrow. It's a great quote uh, about not about not being so possessive of an era that is characterized as passing by. The era is passing by. It's not limitless, not by a long shot. And so those of you who have already been thinking this way, I give you, you know, confirmation that you're thinking the right way. You're still taking care of your kin. You're taking care of your work. But it's not the God Almighty centerpiece. And I will refute this idea tomorrow that marriage and family life and Employment is the centerpiece of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's a mispresentation of it, and it's a dangerous presentation of it because it makes you wonder, what am I, what? It makes you a little bit, uh, I'm not living up to God's program, God's modern program if I'm single, if I have no children. You know, some people shame you for not having children. Have you had any babies yet? Why not? What if you don't want to have babies? Well, in a way, you're shamed. But what if you don't want to bring babies into the world? then maybe you're choosing the higher path. Maybe you are. Don't be intimidated by a misused passage to think that you're not living God's best for your life. Joel Osteen wrote a book, Your Best Life Now. Well, huh, huh, that's one thing, according to Joel Osteen. Some other people would say your best life now would be um, marriage and family and employment, oh my. But I say that your best life now is, is loosening your grip on people and things while remaining loyal to them and loving them, not a contradiction here, and instead loving the appearing of Christ. We are looking for a Savior out of heaven who will transform our bodies into the image of his glorious body. This I am looking forward to together with you.